fire through here. A big reality living in rural California is fire danger. <laughs> I was having a lot of anxiety, as I think a lot of people are like, of not knowing how long we can really stay in, these, in this climate and wanting to have flexibility. Is this an old farm? Yeah, so I mean, the folks that own this farm, I think they've had this land for like 30 or 40 years. Wow. And it's been a Christmas tree farm the whole time. Wow. So there's all these wood chip piles because when the fire happened, they've just done tons of chipping. So they actually lost this entire field in the fire. And these are all new plantings from the last like two or three years. In the fire, it came up all the way to the property and they were able to save their house, but a lot of neighboring houses were lost, unfortunately. I was thinking about building something, you know, permanent on my mom's property, but with the tiny house, if there is a fire, if I have to move, I, I can. And just it gives me more flexibility about where I will live. <laughs> Lavender knows it's the home. I just feel incredibly fortunate that I'm my age and living in California and able to have my own place because it's always been shared. I think what's nice about tiny houses is like you really get to prioritize what's important to you and canning and food storage and having a lot of kitchen space is really important to me. This is canning and it's all from the garden. This is a blueberry jam from the farm and then yeah different types of pickles and Salsa verde, tomatillo, some tomato sauce. I also love to grow food and harvest food. So like, you know, like these peppers I grew two years ago. Cooking is like one of the biggest parts of my life. And chili flakes. <laughs> so yeah, I think like this space is 10, my kitchen's like 10 feet and my house is 24 feet. So it's mostly a kitchen. <laughs> It's mostly a kitchen. Yeah, it's funny because I, in my life, I really emphasize like gathering and cooking for people and being with people. Oh. But this is like the place that I get away from all of it, really. And sometimes it does get lonely to live completely alone up here. I think it's like a really interesting decision to decide to live alone. But for me, it was kind of a long-term desire. It's where I thrive the most, is to live alone. I love being around people, but I think having a space that's my own is really important. I really needed an affordable, option to live in and this was this is what i came up with and i mean i also just i really wanted to build something i really wanted to learn how to build a house they always say that in construction you need 1.5 people and this rock has been my 0.5 person pushing the weight down when i need it I was reading more that you need to use three and a half screws, not two and a half. My mom's construction friend said basically to just add two more three and a half. Drilling holes through this metal trailer. It takes like five minutes for each hole or more. My first hole. Almost done. So exciting. <laughs> Not slipping at all. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of this alone for so long that I just needed some help. Oh, okay. It's slipping. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. With, during the build process, it was like, what can I do by myself? Go up, up. 
and when I'm when do I really really need an extra hand? Oh, is it good? And I think I was a little prideful doing things that I should not have done on my own. So excited right now. Look at this window. Look at all the window openings. It really just totally changes the space. So I just cut my first piece of maple plywood and I was trying to be as perfect as possible. And you can see like on the top there, there's like an inch gap. So I'm just gonna trim out all the corners. I really got in the zone. I'm starting to enjoy myself a little bit more. So today there's a really bad fire close. It maybe looks foggy outside, but it is just thick with smoke because I live in California. This goes like this. My plumbing system. I decided to do a foot pump system. Fill one water up, it'll go through my foot pump. This will be my drainage into the other one. This will really help me conserve water. I can reuse my water. It'll already be in a tank for me to reuse it, water my plants. This will be simple for now. And if I want to change it, I can. I don't have to drill any holes, super easy. And then my flexible hose will go like this. Do the plane. There never used to be planes flying in this area. And now it's multiple times a day, just scanning for fires. It sometimes feels like the world is ending for sure. Yeah. And boom, there's my wastewater. No leaks. The most intense thing about this house is that each day I'm learning a new skill. I trimmed out the windows and it just looks like way more finish in here. I've never done this before in my life. I've never framed a wall. I've never installed a window. I've never installed hardwood floors. It's been just such a intensely steep learning curve. I really didn't want to use like a fat trim like this, but I'm not an expert carpenter, so I couldn't get those seams super perfect. The projected build time for this house is six months. To learn a new skill almost every day. It's almost like my brain can simply not hold. Any more information? <laughs> and it certainly is making this house, like finishing this house, very difficult. I'm trying to do it as quick as possible because I, I have a month. I have a month to finish this house. I have a month to finish registering this house. So I have a month to move this house. I have a month to find a place for this house. It's a little insane. So how did you find this place? A Christmas tree farm, I mean, <laughs> interesting. I know, I mean, I basically just emailed any farms I could find in the area. I mean, I just thought since there's like, there's more access to land with farms that there'd be space. And then eventually this one panned out almost like 10 months after I had reached out to them. So the idea was you would offer rent, yes. that's not work share or something, but like, yeah, that was like part of the, the offer. So they're open on Thanksgiving weekend and I help sell Christmas trees. There are other opportunities for work exchange, but since I'm so busy, I just, I prefer to pay the rent and it's really reasonable. It's only 350 a month, which, <laughs> I think it's kind of unheard of for tiny house parking. Wow. I got really, really lucky. So you have, are you off grid? So I designed the tiny house to be off grid because I didn't know where I was gonna park. And that was actually a huge selling point for people allowing me to be there. Cause you know, if you have a washer dryer and an electric hot water heater, you need a 50 amp hookup. So 
I designed it really, really minimally electricity wise, so I could be off grid. My electricity comes fully from these six 100 watt solar panels. Not much, but it's enough to power my lights and my fridge and also a fan. Do you actually do some sort of research on, you know, the exact coordinates of how to set up, you know, toward the south or, oh, you know? I mean, it's not exact, but I kind of followed what they had in the house. Like, this definitely gets the most light. <laughs> yeah, just in terms of where their solar panels were. And I just kind of copied it. <laughs> I designed my water system to be really minimal so that I could carry in all my water. So I had two five gallon chugs. For the first year, I just changed it actually. And then a foot pump and then the wastewater just went into like a bucket and then I would pour it out on my garden. But that got a little old <laughs> after a year. So we ran a hose under just a hundred foot hose to here and then this is the water coming from that hose over here. And then it's just a little like split thing. This is the one to my shower. This is the one to my house. And then this was just for the garden hose. So this one here goes to the, the outdoor camp shower. Um, oh, it's rustic. I love it's it. It's very rustic. I actually got um, all of this from the dump. So this is like salvaged fencing. Literally at the dump? People yes. And there's so much free wood. It's amazing. This is all from the, I mean, it's wow. a little rickety, but this is all from the dump. The deck just was salvaged off the street. They were getting rid of it. So yeah, this is the shower though. So it's a really simple propane shower. And I, the reason it took me so long to get this is because I wanted to be 100% off fossil fuels, but it's really difficult Basically, like enough to heat my water and cook my food from solar would be probably like 20 or 30,000 just for the solar system. So this is temporary and then eventually I'm going to build like a solar hot water heater. The siding is all cedar siding. I got it from a local cedar mill and so I found this like product called Eco Wood Treatment, which just is completely non-toxic and you only put it on once and it basically just evenly ages and weathers the wood. At first, I really wanted a super minimal look. I wanted really simple siding and sort of like a Scandinavian look with really, really light wood. And then as I lived in it a year, I started like adding a bunch more like darker woods and just more color and more separation. And it kind of like just became more homey. So you started off with like, what are we, what's the siding? Yeah. So the, the inside is maple plywood. Okay. So this is a, a quarter inch maple plywood. And then the ceiling is a half inch maple plywood. And it's also just really lightweight compared to something like a drywall that also is prone to like cracking when you move. I like the look of the wood. I think yeah. <laughs> it feels really nice I do too. and simple. It, yeah, just light and it's physically lighter. Yeah, it's okay. a lot lighter. Yes, yes. Okay, so it makes sense for a tiny home actually. Yeah, and especially the quarter inch, like it's, it was so easy to install for one person. And the floors are also maple and I got these for $100. It was just excess from a larger project because they just had a little bit and it was perfect. It fit it perfectly. I mean, it's all wood. You yeah, it's all wood. Yeah, this I had a lot of help with, with actually some, my collaborator and partner. He's like a more detailed woodworker than I am. So all of this is salvaged. So this is all salvaged. All, this oak is old oak salvaged. This as well. We try to reuse as much as we possibly can. And like when this before, like it was in the state as it is now, it was like completely covered in dust and looked like maybe a throwaway piece of wood. But if you just like take a grinder to it or a sander, it just exposes like it's beautiful green. Wow. And the contrast with the modern <laughs> legs. legs. Yeah, this is actually the one thing that came with me from my old apartment. And there was eight people at this table, but they're like these legs that you can just put on any surface and then it becomes a table. So this one's also salvaged. I used like <laughs> old siding here. But there's so much wood. It's really amazing. And then this is just covering um, my solar and my battery oh. set up down there. 
What do you have down there? I have two 200 amp hour batteries, charge controller, oh, and an inverter. And then I also have the capacity to switch to the power of the house power if I needed more. Oh, down there. Okay. Yeah. I built this so I can make it more of like a ritual to put my bedding away so that the space can feel transformed. So this is like a, it can be multi-purpose. So it can be a couch, but also a, the bed. It's nice to be able to just put the bed away when people are over. I didn't feel that I needed a couch and that's why I decided not to have a loft. And I also, usually in tiny houses, you have to deal with the wheel wells and you have to build around them. But I decided to get a deck over trailer so it's actually one foot higher, it's three feet high. And that's great because then you don't have to do with the wheel wells. And then that allowed me to actually like have my French doors right in the middle and have it feel really open and expansive to the outdoors. But the negative of that is then you lose a foot of headroom. So a loft becomes nearly impossible. This was not here when I first was living in the house or when I first built it. And I had these like massive shelves over my bed with all of my books. It was really nice, but the feeling of having books over your head is kind of a lot to sleep with. So I ended up taking it down and I was also just wanting a little bit more privacy when I slept. So yeah, it's really nice. I don't do it all always, but it's nice to like be able to close this in or even like halfway. It was really important for me to keep this whole space really open, but as I lived in it, I kind of wanted to like delineate space a little bit more, like creating, this is like the little office <laughs> and kitchen while still keeping it really open. I tried to avoid building out two feet on both sides because I can create this hallway effect. Traditionally, counters come out 24 inches, right? So. A lot of times you'll see like these sort of like galley style kitchens where there's like two feet of counter here and then two feet of counter here, but like that would be coming out to right, right here. I was really resistant even to putting anything right here because I wanted to consolidate all of the stuff and the clutter and like the, the bulk of the things that s stick out on this side and then have these windows, these corner windows here and these French doors here so that it really felt like it was like expanding out of this side. Initially, I was actually gonna put my um, closet out here in the kitchen, but when I decided not to do a shower in the bathroom, I was able to put my closet there. This is the bathroom. So it's really, really simple. This little medicine cabinet that was also the salvaged wood, and then the mirror broke. So Dov, my partner, like made this little would cut out to fit it to like reuse the yeah it's really beautiful and then just hides all the clutter and then just towel storage and then i have the nature's head composting toilet and it separates the liquids from the solid yeah, yeah so in the front you can see those two holes that's where the urine goes and then with the solids you open up this latch and then it goes into the back okay and then it mixes it, o yeah. it opens like this okay the solids go in the back and then it mixes with coconut core and then in the front it's just a little bucket you can dump the liquids out because it's sterile and the compost toilet has been really amazing actually it's cool to you know urine i can reuse it with water for fertilizer for plants and then i'm creating compost from my waste and then it's just clothes and then closing this is all my storage, huh? oh it's, it's your closet it's my whole closet wow. um so originally i was going to do a shower here but again, I didn't know if I was going to be off grid. I didn't know what my water situation was going to be like. I was feeling really conflicted about the hot water heater and I was also running out of time. Yeah. So I just did the shower outside and it works pretty well. It's also very efficient to, you don't use that much water because you're just trying to shower as quick as you can. Yeah, I mean, in the tiny house, you're just generally so much more aware of your inputs and your outputs because you have to deal with the water that leaves your house right, and you're right. you have the sun supplying your energy so i can't just like plug in a toaster or there was no way i could run an electric small toaster oven on my solar so i got this for free actually it was on natural gas but there was this really funny guy in my town that 
converts old vintage stoves from natural gas to propane, which there's not that many people that do it, but he did it. And that cost me around $300 to get it converted. I originally was thinking that I would have no fridge because I was trying to do more just like fresh veggies from the garden and doing the canning. And I didn't know if I could afford the solar system at the time. And I didn't know what my access to power was. I don't use this for much. Like it's pretty empty and most of my dry goods are out. And then I bring in meat and I cook it pretty immediately. Does Little freezer, yep. Did you consider a solar fridge? Yeah, that's always like the question when you're on solar, like what to put on DC and what yeah. to put on AC. Yeah. So everything in here is on AC, except for the lights. The lights okay. are DC. And then I have a little chart, like a direct USB charging to charge my phone and my computer right next to my bed. This is really fun because you can turn on, turn on and off the lights from the bed <laughs> um, and from the entrance here. And then this, these ones are also on dimmers, these LED lights. So yeah, all the lights are on 12 volt and they're really, really low wattage. They basically take no power at all to run, which is really great. So if I wanted to plug in eventually, I could and get all the things like AC and if I want that. That's not what I want right now, but you never know. <laughs> so the recess lighting looks difficult. It's actually not. They're meant for RVs and they're just little 12 volt lights. You just wire them up. You have to cut a little tiny hole in the plywood and then they have these little things. You just pop them up, and put them, put them in. The, these ones actually were much more tricky. You can turn it off from bed, uh, from the bed. These lamps I actually got at the salvage yard. I think a two dollars each. Oh wow. Yeah. So yeah, that's all on 12 volt. And then I have a couple plugs that are all AC plugs. It kind of depends on the time of day, what I can run. Like right now, I could probably run an electric cooktop mm -hmm. for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then I like, I got really into these like battery operated <laughs> appliances because you can just charge them. Yeah, and this is, I just use this as my exhaust fan. <laughs> it's a little battery powered fan. And then I just, I don't have any exhaust fan. I, I just have to cook with the window slightly open and this has helped a lot. So this is my only source of heat. <laughs> this is a tiny wood stove. The hardest part is that because this is like a size of a sheet of paper, you have to cut down the wood. So this is already pre-cut to the size. And this is a really amazing little hatchet that my brother got me for Christmas and it cuts wood so well. It's funny when you simplify your life like this, you think it'll be a lot easier. <laughs> so in the first year, there's actually just like so much labor that goes into creating a space like this and making it really functional. But I did try to look at like those actions like cutting firewood as sort of meditations. I was trying to make them really intentional. In the yeah. summer, it gets a little hot. So I installed these blinds. They're blackout blinds. So they actually keep out a lot of the heat and keep yeah. it much cooler. This was another like last minute, really rushed thing, but it was just left over from my roofing. I really wanted to have like some copper and metal elements, which you can see like the copper piping here and that's just copper pipe. That's it. And then my sink is just copper pipe and shark bite connectors. So shark bites are just used in plumbing where you don't have soldering tools. They're quick connections. It's really simple. You just like literally go and then they connect. It's almost impossible to get them off. You need a special tool. This is also just like a shark bite. It's used like for more hidden plumbing, but I just used it because you can get it at the hardware store for 10 bucks. Yeah, just really simple. And this is a huge luxury after carrying in my water for eight months. It's so amazing to be able to just turn it on. And a lot, of, I really do think about function, but I do think a lot about aesthetics too and how it makes the space feel. Yeah, even just like 
my spice rack. <laughs> it's very calming for me to do stuff like this. For me, if my external reality feels organized, I think it helps me feel really calm. <laughs> So you really, st your pantry is really exposed. I mean, it's super exposed. Yeah. Yeah. Most everything is open. I tried to have everything open as sort of a challenge to like keep myself accountable to taking care of my things and having really beautiful things. I used to make more like studio art, but yeah, we're now in this program that's called environmental art, which is kind of fitting <laughs> for my life. And I think I really tried to adopt this idea of like the living arts and then I just wanted to make it more practical and functional and like create spaces that feel really good to be in. So yeah, I do, I do think that like my art background comes through in this house. Yeah. But like before there was just curtains here mm -hmm. and it's been really nice to just like close it off. <laughs> Down here is like the stuff that's like not as pretty. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of food storage, I think, you for do. a tiny house. The main things that I do with a tiny house are cook mm -hmm. and I like to like lay in bed. I, that's pretty much yeah. what I prioritize. Yeah, it's funny because like it does feel, even when I'm cooking in here, like it feels like how it used to feel when I was making art in my studio, which is funny. Everything feels really intentional in this space when I'm moving around even. So things have meaning? <gasps> yeah, it feels like everything, like, yeah, it does. The time flies on those situations, right? So yeah. maybe being intentional is kind of probably almost like a meditation, as you were saying. Yeah. Right? Yeah, time when I'm here really disappears. <laughs> I get home at sometimes four or five usually, and I don't, I barely check the like time. It just goes really very fast, but not even fast. It just is a different type of time. <laughs> I do a lot of like work in communities and I'm talking and I'm, I worked as a teacher and being alone is like, it's essential to like recharging. So I think that's also why I, I wanted to build this space. So I would just, I would have the energy to keep doing the work that I want to do with people. You can see some of the like fire damage on the trees actually, like the big madrones over there. And so this whole field was wiped out and so they're sort of, they've been sort of recovering from that loss i'll always live in fear here that my home will burn down i know that if i am going to stay i have to develop a different relationship with fire but what's really amazing is in the the spring there was a super bloom this year so this this, these entire fields were filled with um, lupins and poppies. I've really been looking to like indigenous leaders because they know better than any of us that fire has always been a part of this land. It actually rejuvenates the soil. It gives life to new native species. The difference is we've mismanaged the forests for hundreds of years. What happens then, right, we all know, are these like mega super fires. And it's it's terrifying. It's really terrifying. So a part of me wants to leave. Like, you know, I want to just take my house and go. But when I really think about where I want to be, it's here. I'm trying to figure out what that can look like in this type of climate. 